everyone. Thanks so much for joining me on the Bio Breakthroughs podcast. I'm your host, Jared Taylor. Joining me today is the co-founder and CEO of HDT Bio, Steve Reed. Steve, how are you today? Hi, Jared. Great. Thank you. Good to be here. I'm excited to have you. Let's dig right in. Tell the audience about your background. Uh, I'm a microbiologist, immunologist by profession. I've spent 40 years working mainly in uh, vaccines for uh, infectious disease and cancer. I spent a lot of my time at Cornell Medical School, after actually 40 years. Uh, I've lived in Brazil directing the Cornell Medical School program overseas for five years. Uh, did a lot of work in tuberculosis, leprosy, neglected diseases is our passion. And I'm bringing that passion to HTT, uh, focusing on viral diseases as well as cancer. Our goal is to make solutions that are broadly applicable and affordable so that everyone has access to state-of-the-art therapeutics and vaccines. So obviously your, your career was so focused on this before founding HTT Bio. What was it that made you want to, is, you know, it's not easy, uh, start this company and, per, and pursue this mission? Yeah, you know, we've had, uh, I and my colleagues all over the years have had a lot of funding from the government for grants and contracts, and that's great. But the company environment allows you to move a little faster usually and take advantage of uh, other resources that you don't have in, in academia. Um, but the technological reasons were just the evolution of thought and, 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 and resources that we have to bring to bear on vaccines and therapeutics. The RNA uh, revolution is real. I've worked for many years on protein vaccines and about 10 years or so on RNA vaccines now. And there's a lot of potential there, but it's just starting to be realized. And uh, I've got a great team of engineers, immunologists, virologists, et cetera, that can make uh, progress in building next generation RNA vaccines and therapeutics. Now, what are what have been some of the bigger challenges that maybe that you've faced or that you've seen? And then how are you addressing those? Well, with, with any new technology, uh, you want to be sure that uh, you answer all the questions that come up from uh, aspects of safety and, and efficacy and We've had these questions over the years, as you know, the vaccine field is rife with uh, controversy at some times. I think our challenge is to uh, get away from crude and undefined vaccines so that we can uh, educate when necessary the public on what has been done to make sure they're safe and effective. And it's always a challenge to do this, but you know, uh, we work on uh, unmet needs, vaccines that don't exist today. And we're hoping that the uh, benefits will outweigh any concerns. But there are technological challenges, no doubt. Those are things that we can easily address. The uh, public opinion challenges are something that's always there. But um, as I said, we do our best to make sure that we address all the safety issues along the way and work closely with the regulators. Talk me through your Amplify vaccine platform? So Amplify, we give that name to this platform because it has two components that are unique in the RNA business. Uh, one, the uh, RNA that we inject has the ability to expand uh, once injected uh, in a limited way for over a few days so that you get uh, a much better effect with a very little amount. This is great from a safety aspect as well as a cost aspect. The most important feature, though, of the F5 vaccine platform is the formulation or the delivery vehicle that we use. You know, all vaccines are formulated somehow, whether it's just saline or whether or whether it's some other more complicated uh, delivery vehicle. But in our case, this vehicle is designed specifically to stay locally um, so that you do not have issues of the vaccine traveling throughout the body, which we've seen with other RNA vaccines. So the platform is comprised of two components, one, a self-amplifying RNA, and two, a delivery vehicle that's very safe and effective. The advantages are you can use one-tenth or less of the vaccine than you can with traditional RNA. That means the costs are very reasonable. We can make a dose for less than a dollar quite easily. But the other advantage is that it gives you uh, the kind of immune response that you need for complicated diseases such as cancer. 
something I hear a lot when when we interview people is people come up to me and they're like, how did they decide to come up with this? How did they decide to pursue this? I know this has been mm -hmm. a passion for you uh, being in this space for for years and obviously at the academia level and then, you know, starting this company. Where like where does that drive come from, Steve? Uh, so, you know, it's very interesting when you ask this question, because sometimes we don't think about all the processes that went into evolving uh, the approach we're taking today. But where it really came from, the observation from nature that um, uh, live viral vaccines can be very, very effective. And we've all we've known this for years. Some of the vaccines we still take today are either live or killed viruses. The viruses has very unique mechanisms to turn on the immune response, but they have real challenges in terms of manufacturing and uh, some technical issues that are not desirable, let's say. What we went about to, to do is create an artificial viral vaccine that's totally synthetic, requires no uh, biological components, uh, no animal products, et cetera, that can mimic the optimal response you get from a viral uh, infection or a viral vaccine uh, without any of the uh, side effects or production disadvantages. Your body is tuned to respond to viral infections or bacterial infections. You, you're assaulted by viruses every day. And so we're taking advantage of the natural host immune system, making it think that there's a virus that we're injecting, but it's not. It's a, actually synthetic, non-living, totally um, reproducible RNA vaccine. So, yeah, it's taking challenges that have arisen from technologies. You know, one example is, Jared, we developed a tuberculosis vaccine in conjunction with a big pharmaceutical company years back and then found that it worked, but got to the point of trying to distribute it and found out that it was just too expensive to make for the markets that, uh, you know, tuberculosis people would, 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 would need. And so this technology, we're not only looking at the uh, biological efficacy, but we're looking at very practical components as well, you know, storage conditions, uh, uh, cost, et cetera. So there's more to getting a vaccine out there than just the technology. Uh, you have to make sure that it's affordable and it's acceptable. Why, why is, <laughs> it seems like not to not, not to knock anyone, right? Like everyone in in this industry is is progressing and, and creating you know hopefully life changing um, medications and, and vaccines, but you you really do call, talk a lot about affordability, and and how in, in your planning how important has that always been in whatever you're building? You know, um, when I give a talk on leprosy vaccines, I say no more leftovers for leprosy patients. In other words. Traditionally, they're the vaccines that have been used in leprosy are just left over from vaccines that used for TB, for example, that don't really work for leprosy. And what we've done is apply state-of-the-art technology to make, you know, real vaccines. But it they just don't go anywhere if um, they're not taken up by public agencies, and the government won't buy the vaccine if it's not affordable because. Unfortunately, these are neglected populations. Now, we have a saying that I borrowed from the uh, a, a, a documentary I saw called White Coat Rebels, uh, where these young medical students said, we believe that no one should be sick because they're poor, and no one should be poor because they're sick. And so, sure, we like to talk about underserved populations and making sure they can afford things, but Look at in, in this country where people can lose their house if they're uh, undergoing cancer treatment. So it's a it's a concern from both sides. Well said. Uh, and I want to make sure we, by the way, Steve, we call this out. You're at an event right now. Talk us through how that's going, uh, how, how the conversations are going, the discussions. Uh, let, let's hear some about that as well. Great. Yeah, I'm up in Vancouver for the Society of Neuro-Oncology, or so-called SNOW meeting. Uh, this is focused largely on glioblastoma, but also pediatric uh, neurological cancers. Very tragic, as you know. Glioblastoma uh, is one of the most serious uh, types of cancer with very uh, 
very bad prognosis and poor survivability. The emphasis in this Congress is new ways to um, not only get the tumor out of the brain, but also to prevent it from coming back. And there's a lot of uh, hope and a lot of expectation around immuno immunotherapeutics. That's what we do. Um, and so people are excited about new, new trends. Uh, some of these are local. They can be done in, intertumorally in the brain cancer itself, but others are injected. And that's where we come in, uh, vaccines that prevent the recurrence and increase uh, survivability. So like any other oncology meeting, this one has, a, it's very upbeat. Last week we went, were at the uh, SITSI meeting, Society for Immunotherapy and Cancer, and huge, uh, huge turnout for that meeting in San Diego where immuno-oncology is really taking off. You know, Jared, what we, one of the things that we do at HTT is work with the National Cancer Institute um, in, in Washington, D.C., in Bethesda. And uh, they have a huge program called PREVENT. Uh, I encourage everybody to look it up if you have time, PREVENT Network of NCI. And this is the future where people are going to be screened for cancer markers and using safe and effective vaccines to actually prevent them in the first place. So cancer vaccines are real and they're coming along quite fast. Before we, before we let you go, Steve, and, and thanks, and we'll, uh, we'll have to, maybe we can grab a link from you and put that in the uh, show notes so people can check that out. I do want to ask you the importance of partnerships since you did bring up that, that relationship, right? Uh, how important are partnerships for H HDT Bio? Um, and what can you share with us in terms of the, those types of partnerships that you would like to form more of? Yeah. So, you know, we're an innovation shop, Jared. We're, 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 we're a bunch of scientists and techno technical people that develop. We're not, we're not a pharma company with mass marketing, et cetera. We need partnerships. We need to make sure our products get out there. They're taken up. They're, they're funded uh, to go all the way through approval. Um, in the old days, I'll say even today, that would have been largely the role of big pharma. Unfortunately, big farmers coalesce to the point there's very few left. They've been gobbling up each other. So there's only five or six big farmers around. But we do things a little differently. We like to focus on local partnerships as well. Uh, for example, in Brazil or other countries where um, uh, smaller pharma companies or government agencies will work with us to get the products approved. Um, because in many countries, uh, acceptance is depending on local production, local manufacturing, not uh, uh, just some big pharma that they import drugs from. So we partner with uh, companies and government agencies in foreign countries, as well as our own government. I mean, our partnerships with the uh, government agencies in the United States are very, very important. Um, and that's probably the most important partnership we have today. The National Institute of Health, National Cancer Institute, BARDA, DARPA, et cetera. I know you can't, what, only what you can share What's what's next for for the company that that really excites you that you're looking forward to? Wow, uh, so many things. So um, clinical data that come from our programs in viruses and in oncology. I think the thing I'm looking forward to the most is um, is probably the uh, uh, cancer vaccine that we're preparing to prevent uh, brain metastasis in breast cancer patients. Um, it's a it's an area we, I and uh, uh, other scientists in the company worked in for years. We know how to do it. The technology is there today. Um, and we're about to enter clinical studies to, uh, to make it happen. So, yeah. Oncology is really what excites me the most because we've all been working there for many years, but only now with the RNA revolution can some of these uh, vaccines actually be produced and made in a safe and effective way. And I'm happy to talk about that anytime. Yeah, I, I want to get to you. We'll, we'll have to plan to get you maybe on a uh, an oncology like panel that we're putting together too, and we can dig deeper and oh, we can great. get a good uh, group of folks on there. Um, so let's circle up after this, and we can see uh, if you have any recommendations of who you would also like to speak with. But uh, Steve, it's been a pleasure chatting with you here today, and enjoy the rest of your conference, and can't wait to talk again real soon. Appreciate it, Jared. Thank you. Mm -hmm.